thank goodness it's only going to be 108 today Ooh, it's hot out and we got a honda with a report of the ac not working properly Let's see if we can get this thing fixed all right as you can see we got this old honda accord here the complaint from the owner is that the ac is only blowing hot air it's not blowing any cold air when they activate the ac so let's see if we can't troubleshoot this thing and get it fixed and real quick before we do anything how about we go over some of the components obviously inside we have the switches and controls not only for our blower motor but to turn the ac on and we have our evaporator inside there evaporator core and then coming out here we have an expansion valve right there and then we have, well, let's go, we have our compressor, our AC compressor, which is right down there. And we have our condenser, which is right in there. And usually we have a receiver dryer, um, and usually it's somewhere out here. Sometimes it's over here, sometimes it's connected to the uh, condenser, but in this case it's under here. And then we have an AC pressure switch, and that senses the pressure in the system, and that um, sends that signal over to the engine computer. And in addition to that stuff, we have a temperature sensor at the evap core and of course we have our two cooling fans and then generally you're going to have a relay that controls the compressor a lot of times it's going to be at or near the relay box but in this model our relay for the compressor is going to be right there so when you think about any issues that could go on we have all the buttons and switches and the controls that turn on our ac system they could be bad we could have a bad compressor we could be low on refrigerant um, we could have a restriction in the line somewhere. Our evap temperature might be a problem, the sensor in there. Our expansion valve might be messed up. Our temperature or our pressure sensor over here by, might be messed up. So you can see there's a lot of different things. And one of the biggest problems I see is cooling fans. Either one or both of the cooling fans not working and that's definitely going to affect um, how well your uh, AC system works. So a lot of things we got to consider. All right, now typically when I'm diagnosing AC issues, I like to hook the scan tool up, look at the data PID, see what the data is telling me as far as pressures and uh, the commands for the AC and things like that. But this is a very early version of OBD2, and, uh, and so I'm, I'm not going to do that today. We're just going to try to keep it more old school as far as the diagnosis. All right, you can see our temperature right there in the vent is 117.1 degrees. Yeah, it's pretty hot. Did I mention it's hot out? Anyway, let's turn this on. And then Honda's, the AC will not work if any speed on the blower, at least on the newer ones. These older ones, you might be able to get away with not having every speed working. But the newer ones that have uh, control modules in there, if every speed is not working on your blower, it will stop your AC from working. And it looks like every speed is working, so we're okay with that. And see if that temperature changes at all. Staying pretty steady. Might drop slightly just having the airflow across it, but I don't have the AC on right now. All right, so at least we know we know that works. And so what I want to do, let's turn the AC on. I want to hear if that compressor is kicking on. So one thing we need to check is the compressor working. And then we want to see if our fans are coming on. And let's look. All right, so you can see both of our fans, neither one of them are on. And if I can show you the compressor right down there at the tip of my finger, that's the compressor clutch. And so we want to see that thing turning once we turn it on. So we want to see that on. That tells us that all of our commands from here to that button in there are working. So that's a good sign. And then we want to see our fans come on. Now this is an old school version, it doesn't have a, you know, it's not split right here with a radiator on that side and a condenser on this side. The radiator's all the way across and then the condenser sits in front of it. Most of the time when you see that setup, both of these fans will come on together when you turn the AC on. Older systems that have a split, they won't do that, but this newer system like this that has a setup where they go all the way across, both of these fans will come on when we turn our AC on. We don't need the all the way up. All right, so we'll turn it on. Well, I hear some movement out there. That's a good sign. And I can 
can see, hopefully you can see it, sometimes the camera doesn't like to pick this stuff up. Both fans are working, so both cooling fans are working, that's good. And can you see that our compressor and the clutch, everything is spinning together. So our compressor is engaged. So that's a good sign, that means all of our controls from here to there are working, so our controls are good. And that means we have at least enough refrigerant in there to, to turn our uh, compressor on. If we didn't have enough refrigerant in there, the pressures wouldn't be okay and the computer would not turn it on. So at least that's good. Uh, one of the other things we need to worry about is the diverter valve that's in there. On these old ones, there's a valve down there. So when you turn it over to heat, that switches it and allows coolant to flow through the heater core. And that way you get your heat. And then when you turn it off, it cuts that off. And so the, the coolant just circulates this way and it doesn't go through your heater core. Now in newer systems, the coolant always flows through the heater core and there's just a door in there. So just keep that in mind that on newer systems, they don't have this valve. But this old one, we want to make sure the valve is working. And even on newer systems, we would want to make sure the door works. So we'll go turn the heat on and see what it does. All right, well, it at least, just looking at that, it cooled it down to about 105. That's a good sign. We're gonna turn it all the way up, and then we're gonna turn our heat all the way over. And see, we're gonna watch and see, does this go up, indicating that our heater core and everything is working? And you can see it's going up drastically. So I don't think there's a problem with our diverter valve. It looks like it's working okay. So we'll turn that back, I'm already hot enough. And we should watch that drop back down. So yeah, it's dropping back down to where we were, well, at least till where we started. And then with the AC on, it looked like it dropped it from about 116 or 117 down to roughly 105, 106. Now it's hot out today, so it's not surprising that it's that high. Um, but this looks like a classic um, case of undercharged on the refrigerant. That's what I'm going to guess right now, seeing as everything else appears to be working. Now, anytime we're working on an AC system, we, know, we need to know what type of refrigerant we're using. Uh, we have the older R12 stuff, we have the newer R134A, and we have the brand new R1234YF. So we need to know what we're dealing with. In this case, you can usually um, look under the hood and you usually find a sticker. And right here we can see we are dealing with R134A. So that's what this Honda uses. And then typically there's going to be an oil that's circulated in there. And we need to know what type of oil it is. Um, Honda used a couple different manufacturers, but on this vehicle they used um, Nippon Denso, which um, they, their oil was ND Oil 8. And what that is, it's a PAG 46. More specifically, it's a double end cap PAG 46. The double end cap just means it's less susceptible to moisture contamination. Um, so if we want to, at the very least, we need to use a PAG 46. But if we want to keep to the original specs, we want to use a double end cap PAG 46. Um, so typically, when you pull refrigeration out, you're probably going to pull a little bit of oil out, a few milliliters, all right? And so whenever we put the refrigerant back in we need to put the same amount of oil back in the system and that's why it's uh, it's always good we need to know what kind of oil is in the system now I don't think this system's been recharged in a few years or at least a couple years and uh, no matter what system it is even the brand new ones they're always going to leak a little bit of refrigerant each year even the best sealed systems on these on on a vehicle you know air conditioning system they're going to leak a little bit so in your house they're not as susceptible because they don't have the movement but when you're talking a vehicle all the flexing and bumping and everything um, a little bit of refrigerant escapes just a tiny bit every year and it's really difficult to stop that um, so it's not uncommon after a few years especially when you get up to the five or six year range for a vehicle to need to be recharged now before i do that i'm going to take my little sniffer out and we're going to see if we can find any leaks at least any obvious leaks. These service ports are notorious for leaking on any vehicle, not just Hondas. I'm 
I'm especially looking at connections and things like that. That's usually generally where they're going to leak. Or down here around the compressor. I'm not seeing the obvious leaks. So we're gonna go ahead and hook up the machine and uh, we're gonna probably go ahead and recover this and see if we're low on refrigerant. Now I have this dedicated um, AC recovery and recharge machine. You can see this thing is they're pretty expensive. It cost me a bunch of money. Uh, it's really difficult to um, be able to diagnose and, and work on AC systems without having some kind of machine like this. Um, the only way we're going to know if that is low on refrigerant is we need to remove um, recover all the refrigerant and weigh it and see how close it is to what it's supposed to be. And you can see we're supposed to be at 650 kilograms or 22.9 ounces. That's not very much. And so it's very easy to just lose a little bit of refrigerant over time and then there's not enough refrigerant in there you know, to do what it's supposed to do and, and cool. So there's enough refrigerant in there to turn the AC on or turn the clutch on, but there's not enough refrigerant for it to work properly. And so really the only way we're gonna know that is if we weigh it. Um, what's nice about this machine is I can recover it. It'll tell me the weight. It'll pull out any oil and it'll tell me exactly how much oil it pulled out. And when I'm using the automatic feature, it will actually inject the oil back in. I just tell it what oil to put back in and whatever it pulls out, it knows and it'll put exactly the right amount in. I can inject dye with this and that's what I'm gonna do also. And then I can put the exact proper charge. I can tell it what to do and it'll recharge it. It can, it'll, and it will evacuate the system and pull it, put it under a vacuum and search for any leaks. So not only will it uh, um, put it under vacuum for as long as we want, but it'll leak test it also and then recharge it. So. It's nice, but it's expensive, um, but it, uh, I'll be honest, it's really difficult to do without that type of machine. So I think what I'll do, hook the, once I hook the machine up, I think I'll, we'll check the pressures to begin with, see where we're at, and then we'll uh, recover it, and then um, we'll put it under a vacuum and do a leak test, and then if it passes with everything, then we'll go ahead and recharge it. If it looks like there's any issues, I'll just stop the machine. All right, as you can see, I got the high and low hooked up. I'm wearing my safety gloves and safety glasses. Don't want to work around this stuff without at the very least gloves and glasses. And let's see where our rest pressures are at. Can you see that? Looks like we're just a hair under 100 for our high and our low. You can see we got high and low. So that's where our pressures are right now. And generally that's gonna be very close to what our temperature is. So we're just gonna do an auto recover and, and it's going to do everything for us, which is kind of nice. Now, yeah, let's see, what did we say it was? 650 kilograms. Charge on the high side, no additional oil. Uh, we are going to inject dye. So we're just going to check our pressures before we uh, recover everything, and it wants me to turn the AC system on. And you can see with our AC on, we're at 10, and uh, I don't know, what's that, 130, 135? We're very low. Uh, we're more, much lower than we should be. So we'll just take a snapshot of that. And then we'll go let it do its thing. 
So I'm going to turn off the vehicle and then we'll recover everything. And I don't know if you can see, I just turned it off and you can see our pressures went back to normal very quickly just like they're supposed to. They're not supposed to take a long time. If they do, that means we might have a restriction in the system. So that's actually a good sign that we probably don't have a restriction and we're probably just low on refrigerant. All right, and you can see we're doing a low side clear. I'm going to start recovering the refrigerant. You can tell when it starts recovering the refrigerant. These needles start going down pretty fast. And while my machine's working, some of you might have a question. You might see something like this where it says 600 on the minimum and 650 on the max. Honda always recommends charging it to the maximum. The only time I would put it at a minimum is if I would if I had a bad compressor, if I suspected it's been having trouble and going out, especially if somebody previously overcharged it, because um, that's how you can damage compressors is by putting more than 650 in, um, I might put it down to 600. But in normal circumstances with no issues, Honda always recommends putting it to the max charge. a vacuum for 45 minutes we do that to get rid of any moisture that might be in the system um, out here I feel 45 minutes especially for what the temperature and the humidity is it's fine obviously I live in a dry uh, climate there's not a lot of humidity so I don't have to worry about too much moisture in the system but moisture in the system can cause it to degrade and not work properly so we do not want any moisture in the system so that's why we're putting it under a vacuum um, so we'll let it do its 45 minutes thing and then it'll then it's going to um, leak test it and then we'll recharge it. And then if you saw, it pulls the oil out and puts it in here so I'm going to have to dump it afterwards. Not very much, you can barely see it. Um, but that little bit that, was, um, that it pulled out, it's going to put back in. And it automatically injects it right out of here. That's my PEG 46 right there. And then that's the dye and it's going to inject a little bit of dye. What's nice about this machine is I do not have to take my hoses off and then put an injector in there and inject oil and then inject dye. I can just leave it um, connected and the machine does it all for me. And on this machine we always want to make sure our oil for our vacuum is at the proper level and we're looking good. And while it's under vacuum now we just sit around, eat popcorn, drink soda and stuff, you know. Now I believe this vehicle is just undercharged and that's why the AC is not performing the way it's supposed to be. There's probably a small leak somewhere that we're not able to find with our tester. Hopefully um, if it's a big enough leak and it continues to be an issue we should be able to find it with our dye that we're going to put in. Um, that's why I, because I suspect it's just a very small leak that's been leaking over years, I went ahead and did the auto feature and we're just going to um, do everything all in one step. Uh, if there were issues or like if I need to replace a component on there or something I can do every step with that machine separately so I could recover it I could put it under a vacuum um, and I can recharge it all in separate steps rather than do it automatically all at once so that's always an option if I need to do it which I like all right while we're waiting for that vacuum to finish how about we do a two minute refrigerant class you know and go over the cooling cycle we'll start right here at the compressor We've got um, gas coming in, and it's a cool, so we don't want we don't want liquid going into our compressor. It's always going to be a gas there, um, and it's going to compress that um, refrigerant into a high temperature, uh, high pressure gas. So that when it's coming out, it's still a gas, but it's under high temperature and high pressure. And the gas is coming and going to our condenser, and the condenser condenses it back into a liquid. And during that process, we're going to transfer some heat. So. The heat from in here is going to transfer out due to the evaporation, or the condensation I should say, and due to the fact that the air is cooler out here, so the heat's going to transfer. Um, so it's coming out here as a liquid, it goes through our receiver dryer, which um, can collect a little bit of moisture and sometimes some, uh, some excess uh, oil that might be in the system. And the liquid's going to come out. Now older systems used to have a sight glass, newer ones don't have these anymore. Um, it's going to come over past our high port, so this is where our service port on the high side is connected. And it's going to go over to our expansion valve. And the expansion valve is pinching that, and but it is movable. It'll move back and forth, and this thermal tube 
is connected over here and, and it kind of equalizes or it allows it to equalize between here and right here through the use of this diaphragm. Newer systems kind of use a block style, but this one, this, these older ones use a tube. But in any event, it's squeezing this high pressure right here so that it's metering it out. Similar to the way this brake clean, if you sprayed it, it would meter it out under a, you know, going from this to a lower pressure and outside air here, and it would create a really low temperature right here. If you ever had your fingers right here, it gets really cold if you spray it enough. That's what this is doing also. So now we're flooding our evaporator with a much cooler refrigerant as a liquid form, and as it goes through, it's going to evaporate, hence the term evaporation. And once again, whenever we have not only these cooling fins, but we have evaporation taking place or a transformation from a gas to a liquid or a liquid to a gas, we're going to transfer heat. So we're transferring heat, or in this case, transferring heat from the outside, and it's going into the refrigerant. So you're your hot air that's inside your cabin is being transferred into the refrigerant is what's happening. And then it's gonna come out all evaporated as a low pressure gas and it comes through and then we have our low port over here. I had to draw it in, they didn't have it right. But our low port is where our service connection is over here and then it's gonna go into our compressor to start the cycle again. So that's what we're looking at right here. So anytime if there's too much moisture in here, that could be an issue. If we do not have enough refrigerant to flood this evaporator so that it's working right, it's not going to work. Or if there's not enough refrigerant, the um, engine computer will sense that and won't even turn the compressor on, won't even engage the clutch. Um, and also if there's a restriction in any of these lines or hoses or, you know, if the evaporator condenser are plugged up or anything like that, or especially this is a big area. They, um, kind of gets a restriction. It's supposed to do that naturally, but sometimes it can um, get too much, um, the expansion valve right here. But any restriction in there can cause issues. So these are all type of things we need to think about whenever we're diagnosing an AC problem. And now, as you can see, we're doing a leak test. All right, and you can see our pressures are at about 122 at rest now. And that's pretty typical. Usually they're a little bit higher than what the temperature is out, but it's pretty close. You can, as long as you're in the ballpark, you know you're fairly close. But you can see now that we're fully charged, we're, uh, we're definitely higher than we were before. And now we'll go ahead and we're gonna take um, a snapshot of what the pressures are now once we turn the vehicle on. You can see we've stabilized now. We're down to about 40. We'll take a snapshot of that. And you can see we're, eh, what's that, 240 or so? And you can see we're down to 64, 65. That's not bad considering it was 117 coming out. That's actually pretty good, especially for this older Honda. These things aren't known for, you know, really awesome air conditioning, that's for sure. But 64 compared to 117, I'll take that any day. And I'm sure if we got it on the road and started driving and got air, actual airflow through that condenser, it'd be even better. And now I'm just recovering the refrigerant from the hoses so I can disconnect them. So as you can see, we only recovered 0.100 kilograms. So it was pretty darn low compared to what we charged it back up to at 0 0.650. Uh, we took out two milliliters of uh, oil we vacuumed it for uh, 45 minutes our leak test passed we injected our two milliliters back in and we also put some dye in there um, so because it was so low i'll probably have the owner come back within a week or two and we'll uh we'll look for that dye and see if we can find a leak somewhere um, hopefully it's just because this thing hasn't been charged in quite a while but i suspect there's probably a leak somewhere that we might have to fix in the future um, but anyway that's our numbers Hopefully you can see that. Taking it for a test drive in the hottest part of the day, consistently getting 53, uh, sometimes 54, sometimes even 52. Uh, but that's pretty good for this old car. Uh, and this heat is not bad. It's also a good idea to make sure these caps are back in place. I see these missing quite a bit. If you see they're missing, I would definitely replace them. Make sure they're on there and good and snug. 
not only does it keep you know debris out of your service ports but it acts as an additional barrier uh, to keep that refrigerant in the system Ooh, it's 108 outside it's 102 in my shop right now uh, I could cool it down if I turn the cooler on but I left it off because there was already enough noise in here for the video so I left it off for you guys because I like you in any event hey I'll take 52 in this old car any day um, I'd have to probably replace a lot of uh, air conditioning parts to get it better. And this old car, the owner doesn't want to put any money into it. They just want to limp it through another hot Arizona summer. So I think it's going to live to at least see another day during this summer. So I think it's going to be all right. Um, if that refrigerant starts to um, go down quickly, in other words, the AC starts to really deteriorate fast, I might have to find that leak and fix it or just recover the refrigerant and then they're not going to have any AC for the rest of the summer. So hopefully it doesn't come to that. In any event, hey, if you like this troubleshooting video and helped you out, make sure to give it a thumbs up. Thanks for watching.